you. We got two more weeks to get this down, so everybody get your right hand up. Hopefully you're not using the paper so much as you used to or referring to the book. Put it up here for those of you who aren't ready yet. Right hand, number one, Jesus came to save. Jesus never sinned. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus is coming back. And our response is to admit our sin, trust in Jesus, turn from our sin, be baptized, and Jesus. So we're going to look at that next one, be baptized today. Interesting, I found this uh, little uh, saying the other day. A guy was driving by a stable, and he saw this sign outside. He says, we have horses for every rider. For those who are small, we have small horses. For those who are large, we have large horses. For those who are young, we have young horses. For those who are old, we have old horses. For those who have never ridden, we have horses that have never been ridden. <laughs> and I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, as you look at the church and you look at Christianity, that there have been a lot of people who have adopted that philosophy when it comes to baptism. They've kind of looked at it and said, we got we got to form a baptism for everybody. You know, we have churches that sprinkle. We have churches that pour. We have churches that I say, and this, I'm not trying to demean anything. I call them dry cleaning churches. They don't use any water at all. Uh, and they're churches that immerse. And, and so we all come, most of us come with some idea about what that means and, and our image of baptism uh, has in mind. Today I want to invite you to do something. I, I want us all to kind of clear that history. I, I know it's hard to do, and, and depending on your generation, I want you to take that paper and erase anything written on it. Uh, if, if you have a whiteboard, I want you to wipe that off, or chalkboard, and if you're really young, take your tablet and hit delete. Uh, get all that information off of there, because I want us to look at an objective uh, idea and what the Bible has to say about this concept of baptism. And we're going to look at four questions regarding it. Uh, we're going to look at first one, what is baptism? Now, there is a, an interesting thing. I want to begin looking at the word. Uh, baptizo means to sink, dip, or submerge. Baptizo is a Greek word. We've just kind of transliterated it into baptism, taking English words, because none of our English words really convey the idea, and it means to sink, dip, or submerge. It's a, a word that the Greeks would use to describe a ship that has sunk. Uh, it, was, it was a word that was used to describe uh, someone who is taking a bath, because you can't take a bath unless you submerge yourself in water. And it's interesting, there's even an ancient Greek recipe for pickle making, that says you baptize the cucumbers in vinegar. Any pickle makers here? Have you ever made pickles just by sprinkling a little vinegar on them? You have to submerge them, right? And so that's what that word means. Uh, and so as we read the New Testament, we come across that word, let's understand that it means to submerge, immerse, or plunge under. Now, People might be asking, what about the sprinkle? And, and, and let's, let's be clear, there are words in the Greek for each of those. Uh, there is a word for sprinkling, which is rantizo. And there is a word for pouring, which is ekcheo. And, and so they had very specific words describing what they were doing. And so today, let's, let's understand a beginning place. that When we talk about baptism, we are talking about a word that literally means plunge, immerse, or submerge. So, but there's a few other things I want us to look at when we think about what is baptism. Let's uh, start with Romans 6, 3 through 4. If you want to turn over there, Paul spends a, takes a lot of time spent talking about baptism here. And I'm going to pick up verse 1. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized, immersed into Christ Jesus, were immersed into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we, may too, uh, we too may live a new life. Look at some of the words in there that are, 
that are a key. It talks about being joined with Christ. It talks about being joined in his dying with Christ. It talks about being buried with Christ. It talks about being raised with Christ. All those elements are important. And, and so what Paul is describing is some act that, that mirrors the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And, and I would submit to you that, that immersion in water is probably the most reliable and most accurate depiction of that. And, and one of the things that happens as we submit ourselves to that baptism is that we are actually proclaiming the gospel. We are proclaiming that our dependence is on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But it's interesting, he says, as we come out of that water, what's the last phrase he uses? That we too may what? Live a new life. I would suggest that Paul is talking there that if we're talking about getting new life in Jesus, it's as we emerge from those waters of baptism that that newness begins. He told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, that language almost carries straight across. Paul says at that point that you, your old man dies and you come out of that water living and new. So it, it's, if you want to, one man said it's the starting line of our relationship with Jesus. It really is the starting line of that walk with Jesus. We're going to talk about more next week. It, it's also the, a unifying tenet of our faith. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is talking about unity within the church. In chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. And verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's interesting that, that he's talking about unity. Paul includes one baptism. Now, that, that suggests to me in God's mind that baptism was to be a unifying tenet with the church. It, it was to be a, a thing that brought us together, understanding we all had that same mind and lived on that same level. And I wonder sometimes how God feels... When something that he intended to unify the church has been used to divide and segment the church. Almost in a, in a mean-spirited way. You know, I've talked to people about baptism, other people, of, of preachers from different faith, and one of the things that they say, well, you're a water regenerationist. And, and that is tantamount to name-calling, in my mind. It's, it's as if we believe the water we dip people in are, is somehow special. Everybody, everybody knew Willamina water was special, right? <laughs> you just didn't know how special. Now I know why it tastes so funny when I drink a glass. You know, we don't believe the water is the key. We believe faith is, but we believe obedience is connected with it. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And, and can we use that to, to bring about a unity? within the church. Can we bring about a, an agreement on that? It's a tenet of the faith. It, it's a pledge of good conscience. Go back to 1 Peter 3, 21. 1 Peter 3, 21. A lot of information, so we're kind of moving along. I hope I'm not going too fast. But Revela or 1 Peter 3, 21. Paul, or Peter's talking about the, the flood of Noah. And verse 21, he says, And this water... That is, the waters of Noah's flood symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. Now, if you think about that word pledge for a moment. It is a business term. A pledge, it, it, it's as if you sat down and talked to somebody about a deal. If you're, if you're going to, to buy a car... You sit down across the desk, usually from a guy, and you negotiate back and forth until you come to an agreement, and then you say, yeah, I can live with those terms, barely, but I can live with those terms, and, and so you agree, but when does that contract become binding? When you sign your name to the bottom of the contract. Well, in Greece, they didn't have signed contracts, but they would talk about a deal, and at some point when both parties agreed, they would both stand up. One party would reach across the table with his hand, and they would shake hands in the presence of witnesses. 
And at that point, the commitment, the contract became binding. Peter uses that word in regards to baptism. He said baptism, it's not just about the outward, it's about that moment when we seal the contract. When we can be held accountable. When we are committed to that agreement. We've come, we've heard God's conditions and we've said, I accept them. And I come out of that water, my name has been signed. And people can then begin holding me accountable for that. In the presence of witnesses. That's the important part. It is uh, anything done in secret can't be held accountable. So it's important. It's a pledge of good conscience. And one last one in Galatians uh, 3.27. Paul again talking about it. He says in verse 27, there's, uh, excuse me, verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, and based on Romans 6, that takes place at the time of our baptism, have clothed ourselves with Christ. It's at that moment, at that time, when we emerge from the water, that we put on the righteousness of Christ, and now are living in His righteousness, justified and holy before God. So if you were talking about baptism, those are important things. There's other things in Scripture that talk about it. But I think those four are, are important ones for us to hold on to when we think about baptism. But let's go on to the next one. Why should I be baptized? Why should someone be baptized? Uh, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. We all remember that. Uh, most of us know it. Acts chapter 8. Uh, Philip has fled Jerusalem because of a persecution. He's gone to the northern regions. He's been preaching the gospel. And he had people believing, developed a church, planted a church there, and it was growing strong, it was growing bigger and bigger. And just when it had great momentum, God comes to Philip and he says, I want you to go south to the desert road. I was reading a devotion this week about round tables at a railroad yard, and uh, it was significant because my grandfather was a railroad engineer. He said, what's a round table for? changing your direction. And it's interesting, as Philip had this direction going in, in his town with a new church, God suddenly puts him on the round table and says, go down to the desert. Now, how many of you know how many people live in a desert? Uh, unless you live in Arizona. Is it? <laughs> but then, you went through a desert. They called it a desert because no one lived there. And maybe, f has God ever asked you to do something you don't understand? And Philip probably went through that, probably said, why in the world would you have me going to the desert? Because I want to preach the gospel. And he's walking along, and he sees the Ethiopian eunuch right along. He hears him reading from Isaiah, and he, the Spirit says, go up and join yourself to that. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand unless somebody explain it? So he gets in the, and rides along with him, explaining Jesus to him. And then they come to water, and the Ethiopian says, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Now, I, I share that with you because it seems to be a complete contrast to the way people respond today. When you talk about baptism, the question I often get is, Why should I? Why should I be baptized? It, and, and so... That's a good question for us to answer, and I want to give you some good answers to that. Number one, because Jesus commanded it. Okay, let's stop there and move on, right? Uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. I, we talked last week about repentance being a recognition of Jesus' authority. And, and if, if someone has authority in life, you obey him. Matthew 28, 18, or 19 through 20 is, most of you know, the Great Commission. Jesus is leaving, and he tells his disciples this. Uh, let's start with verse 18. That's important. Then Jesus came to him and said, All, what? All authority. Where? In heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, number one, we have to recognize his authority. And he said, This is what I want you to do. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey 
everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Disciple-making, according to Jesus, includes baptizing them. So, parents, have you ever used that statement when your kids have said, why should I? Because I said so. <laughs> kind of puts an end to the argument. And, and we said last week, if we don't recognize an authority, if we don't acknowledge someone's authority in our life, we'll never obey them. Now, Jesus commanded it. Let, let's go on to another reason. The apostles taught it. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 41. We were there last week as Peter preached the first gospel message. And we looked at the first part of the, the people said, What shall we do? And Peter responded, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. That's not... A, a, He's not an exception to the rule. Every apostle who the apostles were established to, to create the doctrine and establish the practice of the church, and Peter at the very beginning says, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of, sin, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a connection there that can't be denied. And look at what the response is. How'd they respond? Verse 41, or verse, verse 41, those who accepted his message, if you want to take the word, those who believed his message, those who put faith in the message of Jesus were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Can you imagine 3,000 baptisms in one day? Uh, Eric Nielsen did some math. He said, he would have had to baptize somebody every 28.9 seconds for 24 hours to baptize 3,000 people. So obviously there were some other people stepping in, uh, the other apostles and other people who were baptized, baptizing others. But can you imagine, look around, how many we got here today? 70? Could you imagine the, 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 bur the burden would suddenly come to this church if we went from 70 to 3,000 in one day? It would be a good problem to have. I'm 3,000 in one day when we, we pray all week for one. But the apostles taught it. It was the practice of the church. You read through the book of Acts and you'll find it over and over and over again. And, and the early church practiced it. I, I have some interesting quotes. First 1,300 years of the church's history, immersion was, or was the practice. Look at these John Calvin, who was a Presbyterian, or started the Presbyterian church, said, The word baptize signifies to immerse. It is certain immersion was a practice of the primitive church. Martin Luther, baptism is a Greek word and may be translated immerse. I would have those who are bab to, be, to be baptized to be altogether dipped. Buried with him in baptism, alluding to the ancient manner of baptizing by immersion. John Wesley, who is the father of the Methodist Church. And here's one from the Episcopal Church. Immersion was probably, in all probability, the way in which our blessed Savior, and for certain, the way in which ancient Christians received their baptism. And then from the, a Catholic, he says, for 1,300 years, baptism and immersion of the, was an immersion of the person under water. 1,300 years of church history Baptism was the practice. So why should we be baptized? Well, I believe the first argument is simply the best one Jesus, Jesus said to. So it all be into a practice. And the apostles taught it. It's taught throughout the New Testament. But then let's talk about who should be baptized. Who is it that, that should be baptized? And, and let's bring that down to understanding that there are a lot of different practices. In, in our culture, we have ages at which people are permitted to do things, right? How old do you have to be to go into a bar and get a drink? Not that you should. 21. How old do you have to be to vote? 18. It was 21 until I, my senior year in high school, and I got to vote. I, I want you to know, I am the only person who voted for Richard Nixon that year, and he won. I've never found anybody else who would admit to voting Richard Dixon, so 
I'm not taking blame for the way he turned out, but I just just suggested my my power as a voter is is enormous. <laughs> it's interesting to me. You have you have to be 18 to sign a contract. At 18, you can go into the service, but you have to be 21 to buy a gun. Unless you're 18 and join the service, <laughs> then you can carry a gun. Something happens by signing that contract, you suddenly become a trustworthy person. I, but there's age limits. So as you think about that in terms of coming into a relationship with Jesus, who is it that is able to be baptized? Well, we've kind of gone through that as we've talked about the responses. If we, two weeks ago we talked about the need to admit our sin. Acknowledge the fact that, that we have sinned. Acknowledge the fact that my sin has impacted other people and has offended God. Uh, to know that, that by my nature all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Which leads us to the next one. Someone who has placed their trust in Jesus. Understanding they need a Savior. Understanding that it's a problem they can't fix on their own. And Jesus came and died on the cross to accomplish that. And there's verses there that you could, uh, can look at in, in Acts 10. It's the story of, of Cornelius. Uh, Peter goes to him and preaches, and, and they express faith in Jesus and are baptized. Acts 16, it's the Philippian jailer. We're going to look at that in a little more detail in a moment. But Acts 16, 31 through 34, we have the, the jailer who, who <laughs> asks Paul and Silas, what must I do? And they said, if you believe... You can be saved, and they baptized him. So, someone who places their faith in Jesus, trusts in him totally, someone who has turned from sin. We call that repentance last week. Peter said, Repent. We talked about all the details of that, talking about our sorrow over a godly sorrow that we've offended God. It, it talked about a need to uh, change direction in our lives, a need to, to make some kind of uh, restitution. Uh, if, you, if you look at Acts chapter 16, 31 it, it, through 34, it's interesting. If you go back there and look at it, the jailer, before he's baptized, what does he do? It says, they've replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. I want to suggest to you that is a sign of his repentance. That is a, a sign of, of trying to make amends for the treatment he had received. Maybe even from the hands of that jailer. Uh, trying to make it right. Trying to reestablish that good-natured relationship with one another. To say, I'm sorry for what happened to you. And then to change direction and, and make that amends. Someone who's turned from sin. Someone who said, I want to live differently than I live right now. And someone who has confessed Jesus as Savior and Lord. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, He who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. Romans 10 is a verse we read a great deal about salvation. Romans 10 And verse nine, 8 and 9 says, But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we're proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And, and Lord, that word means taking a step towards salvation. So confessing with our mouth. Confessing Jesus as my only Savior and the Lord of my life publicly. Declaring Him as my hope. And it's at that point, through that point, that we come to a place where we are then ready to take that step into baptism. So we've talked about what it is. Uh, we've talked about the... Uh, other two things, who should be baptized, we've talked about, but the last question is, when should one be baptized? 
Now, I've got a lot of scriptures here. We're going to just kind of go through them, not a lot of comment, but I think they make the point. Acts 2.41, I've kind of summarized some of them there. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Not, not a week from now, but that day. Uh, verse, or chapter 8, verse 12, talking about Philip preaching in the city. It says, but when they believed... Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. If you notice the timing, when they believed, when they came to that point of, of and I define belief as that time when I admit my sin, I trust in Jesus, and I turn from my sin, and I confess him. I think all those are points of faith. And then Acts 8.36 Ethiopian eunuch, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? Acts 10, verse 48, Paul talking to uh, uh, Cornelius, he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me take a moment, Acts 10, it's interesting because he goes to Cornelius, who is a Gentile, the first Gentile to hear the gospel, and at some point in that process, the Spirit descends on them and they begin speaking in different languages. Now people have said, well isn't that a sign of salvation? And I, I, wanted, I want us to understand, if you look at those times when it occurs, it shows that God is putting a stamp of approval. On, on Acts chapter 2, when the apostles began speaking in tongues, it was God's declaration through that, that these men are under, are acceptable to me and they are my messengers. Acts chapter 10, no Gentile has ever entered into the faith before. And Peter went in saying, you know, I've never touched anything unclean. You know it's wrong for me to be in the house of a Gentile. And so the Spirit comes, they begin speaking in tongues, and Peter says, clearly God has accepted these people. And so he commands them to be baptized. And so he ordered that they be baptized. Uh, let's look at Acts 16, 31 through 33. Uh, the, Ethiop or the Philippian jailer, get my people all mixed up. 31 says, they replied, after he says, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. Faith comes by hearing. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. In Acts 18, 8, they became believers. At Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul became believers and were baptized. Acts 19, verses 4 and 5, Paul has come to the city, and he's preaching to people, and they... Uh, hadn't heard of uh, baptism, of faith. And verse 1 says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied they were about 12 men in all. Again, we have that signification of the tongues showing God's acceptance of them. But they were baptized. And now... In Acts 22, maybe one of the most significant ones is the story of Saul. Remember, Saul had the encounter on the road to Damascus. Uh, he had been persecuted of the church, and Jesus set him on the right path, blinded him. He went in, and Ananias came to him and explained the way of Jesus more fully to him. And this is his conversation uh, with Ananias in Acts 22, verses 14 through 16. Ananias says to him, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. 
Ananias says, it's time to get up. It's time to go and obey him. Be baptized. It's significant. We could add back to why should we be baptized or what happens at baptism. It's that point where we call on the name of Jesus. And our sins are washed away. So throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, we see over and over again, when should we be baptized? That moment when we believe. I, I tell people that there's no time like the present. There's no time like now. And, and I always tell people, whatever time that is for you, we need to take care of that. And I said, even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, Dolores will come down and baptize you. No. <laughs> Even if it's in the middle of the night, if, if that's the time God has put it on your heart, then we need to take care of that. We need to, to follow through on it. It's not something to be delayed. I know churches have baptism days. I know churches have wait until there's a group of people ready to be baptized. But in the New Testament, we find over and over again, the moment they believed is the time. And today is a moment. And let me say, look, here is water. Why shouldn't you be baptized? Who is it that, that should be baptized? We, we've talked about it. It's someone who understands how sin has impacted their life. How it has separated them from God and, and, and separated them from any hope of eternal life. It, it's someone who has trusted it trusted Jesus, who heard the message of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, that he died for you to pay for your sin, that you might not have to pay for it, that you would have a new life. It's someone who's willing to turn away, understanding my life is going in the opposite direction from the way I want it to go. I want to be pleasing to God. I want to live in obedience to him. And you're ready to follow Jesus with all that you are. You're ready, you've heard, and you're ready to sign your name on that line that says, I want what only Jesus can give me. What about you? Why shouldn't you be baptized today? Why shouldn't you make that decision? Some of you have been thinking about it. Some of you are here and thinking, well, I've, I've always been taught it's not necessary. But maybe today, maybe, maybe, I'm not trying to belittle anybody's faith or teaching, but what I'm saying, maybe you had never heard that baptism was that important in your faith relationship with Jesus. Maybe you have never heard anything about this before in your life. Or maybe you're here and been thinking about it. Why shouldn't you be baptized today? And as we come out of that water, a new life will be set on the path for the message we're going to look at next week, following Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the new life we have in Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to do significant and, and, and pointed things, Lord, to, to know that in our baptism we are making a claim, we're testifying to our faith, we're confessing to others, I'm in. I'm all in. Like, like uh, the guy that drew the line in the sand at the Alamo and said step across. It's that moment when we step across, we choose a side. Father, help us to, to understand that that is significant and it's important. And it's a time when we can always look back and say it's that day, that moment that I made a commitment. Father, I thank you for that opportunity. I thank you that that you are working in people's lives to help us understand your word. And Father, today I just ask that as we gather around the table today and remember Jesus' sacrifice, to remember his body that was broken so cruelly for us and his blood that was shed so violently. Father, that was done for us that we might have an opportunity in life and help us, Lord, to understand where we need to go with that. Lord, if there are those here today who need to take that step, I ask that you would help them to be ready. I pray that you would help them to have the courage and boldness to step up and make a stand. Thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. In the morning.